Welcome to the Gab Talks by the Independent Press Award. I'm your hostess, Gabby Olzak. To participate in the 2024 Book Award competitions, please visit independentpressaward.com and newyorkcitybigbookaward.com. Today, we get a glimpse into the mysterious life and death of Vincent Van Gogh. Dr. Irwin, Irvin, excuse me, Kaufman Arenberg is the author of Love and Murder, The Final Days of Vincent Van Gogh, winner of the 2023 New York City Big Book Award in Arts and Entertainment. A retired ear surgeon, Irv has unveiled many misconceptions about Van Gogh, beginning with his cover story in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association during the 100th anniversary of Van Gogh's death. Irv has studied Van Gogh's life and death for more than 30 years with the goal to debunk the myth that his death was a suicide. The critically acclaimed Love and Murder is book two of a trilogy. Irv joins us today from Arizona. Congratulations, Irv, and welcome to the Gap Talks. Thanks, Gabby. This is the real fun to be here. Oh, it's so exciting. The book was fantastic. Um, for our viewers and listeners, Irv, I really want to start from the beginning. Sure. Our widely accepted myth is that Van Gogh suffered from epilepsy. How did your career as an ear surgeon play an instrumental role in altering the artist's diagnosis? Well, as an ear surgeon, uh, I had read Vincent's um, letters when I was a student at the university. And I had a, a family friend whose mother had Meniere's disease, an inner ear problem with vertigo. And she had an attack when we were there. Uh, she was making and churning ice cream. And my friend and I were there and she got up off a three-legged stool and said, oh my God, the room's spinning, the room's spinning. And she fell down and she got really sick. And we were just seniors in high school. And we didn't know what to do. And the father came down and said, don't worry, guys. She's having a Meniere's disease attack. She'll, we're going to take her up to her room and she'll be fine tomorrow. Well, that was my first exposure with Meniere. And so I knew what vertigo was. I'd seen a real example of it. And so when I was a art student, I, I read uh, about Vincent's letters and his his attacks that were thought to be epilepsy. But he wrote in his own handwriting that his attacks were vertige, vertigo in French. And I said, oh, Vincent had Meniere's. And I didn't think much about it. But then uh, I became an ear doctor and my special area of interest and expertise was Meniere's disease. And so I developed some surgery for that problem. And back in the 80s, I was uh, pre oping a patient who was uh, going to have this surgery in the next morning. Um, that's the way we did it back in the day. And um, she was scared. And so I sort of you know, you had to get the pre-op consent and all that back then before day surgery. And so I said, well, look, and she was an artist. So I said to her, look, don't worry. There's a really good chance that we can fix your problem, your Meniere's problem. And you're really lucky as an artist because Vincent, we couldn't fix his problem. She said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, Vincent had Meniere's disease. And she said, no, he didn't have Meniere's. He had epilepsy. And I said, no, he had Meniere's. So we went back and forth. I got her to read the letters, and she actually became a uh, contributor. And uh, on the article, she was a she was a co-author on the article for JAMA on the hundredth anniversary of Vincent's death, that was published in July uh, nineteen ninety. And we basically peer reviewed and everything. Never got any feedback negative saying that Vincent didn't, did still have a seizure disorder, epilepsy. So the, the medical world has accepted that he had an inner ear problem many years, which adversely affected him quite a bit. Because if you read his letters, one letter very pronounced said he was so afraid of another attack that was going to forever eliminate his ability to paint. And that might have been one of the things that drove him to paint a canvas a day, his fear of, of losing that ability to paint. So that was one of several 
misunderstandings or misdiagnoses of Vincent in his life that he had seizure disorder. Um, Herb, is this a possible um, uh, reason why uh, the the infamous ear cutting? I've, everyone knows about it. Is this somehow related to the Meniere's disease? In your opinion? Unlikely. It's really unlikely. Okay. Uh, there have been papers because one of the problems of Meniere's is not only the vertigo and the hearing loss, but they also have tinnitus or ringing in the ears. And Vincent also described that. And somebody who knew that said, well, maybe Vincent cut his ear off to try to get rid of the tinnitus. Right. And that's, he didn't, well, first of all, that's a whole nother ball game. But I don't believe that Vincent cut off his ear. Okay. And we described that Vincent had a thing with Gauguin. Gauguin, right. That's right. Yes, I understand. I've read that too. Yes. And, and they... You have to remember that Gauguin was a very macho man. He yes. carried his own swords. He was a very adept swordsman, and Vincent wasn't. And they lived in the yellow house in Arles for nine weeks. And during that time, uh, they would go drinking and to the bordello, and Vincent had this one prostitute that he thought was in love with him named Rachel. And the story that I know, because uh, Gauguin's story is not very believable. He's He's been known to prevaricate and elaborate and embellish a lot of things that didn't really happen. So the story of how Vincent cut off his ear makes no sense medically. You don't just cut off your ear. Right. But what we think happened and as described in the book, is that on the Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas, they were going out to dinner and, and bordello, and Vincent said, I'm going to see Rachel. I love her. She loves me. And Gauguin sort of scoffed and said, that's not, that's not true. She's a prostitute. She just, that's her job. And Vincent said, no, no, she loves me. And he defended her in her honor. And so he challenged Gauguin to a duel. And Gauguin pulled out the sword, gave Vincent a sword, and he did a Zorro. He did flip, flip, and whacked off his ear with a flick of his wrist. Vincent picked up the ear, took it to Rachel to show her his undying love and what he would do to protect her honor. That is more likely the story than Vincent cut off his ear with a razor for God knows what reason. And he and Gauguin had a very tumultuous relationship. Mm -hmm. Van Gogh apparently that day had told Vincent that he was leaving the Yellow House, going back to Paris, and that their their sojourn was ending. Vincent wanted to have create a house of artists working together for the common good. And he, Gauguin was the first and only one he got to come south with him. And that didn't go very well. But that's more likely the story of while the ear episode actually occurred and he cut it off because of his mitt, his inner ear disease. Okay, so so many mysteries. So, Herb, you refer to uh, his death, a presumed suicide, or the myth of the presumed suicide, as the biggest cold case in the annals of the art world. And you've made it your mission to debunk this narrative. Why are you so passionate about investigating this cold case? Well, there's so many things about Vincent. First of all, you got to love the guy. He was amazing. Without a doubt. And you love his art. You love his story. You attach to it. Everybody finds something about Vincent to really connect. I connected, and I used my medical background to try to unravel some of the mysteries. And when I wrote that article for JAMA, I never believed and had done all the research. I never believed that Vincent committed suicide. But then I was still a very busy ear surgeon doing patients and surgeries, and I never really followed up on it. I kept reading, but I wasn't proactively trying to do what I've done in the last five years. Then... I had started doing this work, 
And then the movie Loving Vincent came out and I went to see it and there were some parts in there where the Dr. Masary character explained what was pretty obvious is that Vincent couldn't possibly have shot himself at the angle that was recorded and it just didn't make sense and I felt really comfortable. When I walked out of the movie, I said to my friend at the time, loving Vincent, killing Vincent, loving Vincent, killing Vincent. I decided I had to pursue that and correct another misunderstanding, misinformation about poor Vincent because suicide back in that day was a crime. And, you know, for... In 1890, when he died. Yeah, for Vincent to go down in the annals of history as a criminal committing suicide didn't sit well with me. So I thought, let's see if that really happened. And I dug into it and I was very convinced that it was not possible for him to commit suicide. Um, book one of your trilogy, or Killing Vincent, The Man, The Myth, and The Murder, you say yeah. that suicide is untenable. What's the most profound piece of forensic evidence that you uncovered that disproves uh, this theory of suicide? Well, Vincent... Well, a lot of things, but Vincent didn't have a gun, for one thing, and never really used one. But the point is, is that the the myth was perpetuated as a cover-up or a murder. But if you go back to the actual evidence that was available, which is very limited, by the way, there's no police report, there's no crime scene, there's all the stuff that's listed in the book that you would want for a, a define a, a crime doesn't exist. It's all hearsay. There's no hard evidence anywhere that Vincent actually committed suicide. And a colleague of mine did a, a study going through all his letters and everything to look at the suicidal ideation and everything and see if they could profile him as a candidate for suicide. And by 21st century criteria, using the last 70 days of his life, he had no suicidal evidence, no proclivity to commit suicide. So um, there just, there really wasn't any. So that's part of it. So what did I do to prove it? We did the forensic testing. I bought the same model gun that was alleged to be used to kill Vincent. And the yeah. gun was never found, in fact, correct? Well, they found the gun in a field some 50, 60 years later, coincidentally and very questionably, right at the time when MGM was in Paris shooting Lust for Life in 1953. Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas, brilliant movie except for one thing, which we may get to later, and it was brilliant up to the I'd end. like you to share this, because I do know the story. I, re I read that about you, yes. Okay, well, let me do that now. I'll do that now. The, the movie is brilliant, and at the time, MGM was trying to generate a lot of buzz, and so finding the gun that was alleged to have committed, killed Vincent, or been involved in the murder of Vincent Van Gogh or his suicide, was quite a big story. And the whole thing that MGM really manipulated the story was another big bite at the apple for them to find the guy that killed Vincent. Pretty convenient, don't you think? A little bit too convenient. Yeah. And it, to me, I if you analyze the gun, the gun was not working. The pictures that they have, it has a bent re ejection rod and the it just it just wouldn't work. But the story that the museum perpetuated or put out there was that the gun was dropped where Vincent shot himself. I can absolutely guarantee you if you get a forensic gun expert, they will tell you that the gun they found was not a working gun and it as found. So it couldn't have been dropped by Vincent because he shot himself and it was working at the time because now they couldn't it doing. And what it looks like and what makes sense is that it was from the police in Paris where they dispose of weapons, where they bend them and stuff like that so they can't be used again. 
and somebody in the Paris police department got the gun and sold it or gave it to the people making the movie. And oh, by the way, they found it just at the time that this was all happening. Very suspicious. And I can guarantee you that the gun they found, which by the way, was auctioned a couple of years ago in Paris and brought a 183,000 US dollar hammer price. Wow. And there's no proof other than the museum saying and had put it on display that this was the gun that was used to kill Vincent or Vincent killed himself. So that I can dispute that part of it too, to the nth degree. Um, you referred to Vincent's death as a dastardly murder, a nefarious cover-up. Um, yeah. In fact, your the the book that won the award that's right behind you, "Love and Murder: The Last Days of Vincent Van Gogh," focuses on who killed Vincent and why. So, Erg, let's start with the why. Why do you believe it was a murder? Why? Well, because forensically, forensically, we understand that. Yes. Well, no, I didn't give you the key piece of evidence. Please give it. Okay. In the evidence of the wound that was described, there is no description of a black powder bullet ring around the entry wound. Now, th this was in the day of black powder bullets. Smokeless bullets didn't really come in for a few years. So that was the chief piece of forensic evidence any police officer would have back in that day to s determine whether someone shot themselves or was shot close or were shot from far away. Did they have a powder burn? If they had a powder burn, they can be tell from the size of the powder burn how much powder, whether they were one foot away, two foot away, or more. Mm -hmm. If they have a powder burn, they couldn't be close. So you can't, so the you can't shoot yourself in the belly without a powder burn with the bullets and the gun that they alleged was used. So once you eliminate the possibility that there is no, there wasn't a powder burn, then whoever shot him shot him from a greater distance and several feet away. And Vincent couldn't do that. He wasn't Gumby. He right, exactly. He couldn't do that himself. So then you have to say, well, whoever put that, that hole in Vincent's belly murdered him. So all of a sudden, Vincent's suicide is a is a, gone, a done story. It's toast. It's done. There is no empirical evidence that Vincent actually shot himself. It's all hearsay. So-and-so said it. They did this. And it's interesting because we put in the, the new book coming out um, a challenge to the murder deniers of Vincent a open challenge, which was published in a forensic journal just in the last several months because they claimed there were 10 reasons why Vincent committed suicide. And we went through the whole thing and reason by reason and why they were fallacious, non-relevant, and made no sense. And so that's in the book, and that's in a forensic journal peer-reviewed article that just came out a few months ago. So we put that challenge back in there because it, it, it just didn't happen that way. But the art history community doesn't want to change their history books or their stories or all the stuff they've got marketed because the story doesn't comport with what they would like it to be. Well, that brings me to my next question. So, um, you know, Vincent was not a celebrated artist during his time. However, yeah. now... Um, it's big business. Uh, we, we've all heard about and seen the Van Gogh immersive uh, exhibit. That was fantastic. Um, and you talk about the Van Gogh suicide narrative and its impact on businesses, art museums, enthusiasts. How would the representation of his art, Irv, and his work be altered if murder became the alternate narrative, if people really accepted this truth? I don't think it would change that much. Really? I yeah, I mean, somebody, I would focus more on why he was murdered and what did he do to get murdered, so to speak, and how did that, what kind of art can we relate to that? 
but I don't think it did it did anything to change the brilliance and creativity of his art. I mean, Picasso said he opened up the world to modern art, basically, and he did. Um, let's talk about. I don't. I don't think his murder or suicide would have impacted that. It just changes the narrative so that he's not a so sympathetic poor guy living this, creating his death as a martyr for his art. That's Hokum. It's a good story and some people bought it for years, but it's not what really happened. So let's let's talk about the who. Um, and that'll that'll tell us a little bit more about the cover up. You list a number of possible suspects in your book. Um, tell us about that. Tell us about a little bit more about the why and the who. Well, the why was Vincent met Marguerite Clementine Gachet the first day he got to Aubert, Sir Weeks. He was going to meet. Dr. Gachet, who his brother had set him up to meet and sort of keep an eye on him, because as you remember, he just got out of the asylum for epileptics and lunatics a week or so prior. So Dr. Gachet was treating him, for our listeners who don't know this. Well, I don't think he actually treated him. He was supposed to keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. And they, they formed a friendship, didn't they? they? They did in the beginning, but it didn't seem to pan out that way as you'll see, because Vincent met Marguerite and what was kept quiet is the love affair between Marguerite and Vincent, which uh, materialized fairly early. But the person that really wrote the history was Theo, his, his younger brother's wife, Joe Van Gogh Bunger who got all the letters and the art, well, not all the art, but a lot of it, after Vincent's death. And she wanted a very family-friendly remembrance of the brothers and their amazing filial love for each other. And so she edited or censored a lot of the story, which is interesting because they found a letter that was... In, misfiled in the archives in Amsterdam. And this was published and analyzed in Der Spiegel in 1990. And a lot of the stuff that was covered up or glossed over, they're going back and finding, you know, that, yeah, there's, it was known that Vincent and Marguerite were lovers. Marguerite's best friend knew that and they were she was her confidant and knew that uh, they wanted to get married but the doctor didn't want that to happen possible motive oh absolute motive because okay. the father was very jealous of Vincent when he realized that Vincent was a genius and he wanted Vincent's art he was a very big collector of um, Parisian artists in the 1880s and into 1890. He had Monet, Manet, Renoir, Lautrec. He had all the great artists, and he was he went to all their showings, and and he built a great collection, which was eventually donated to the Louvre, and that's part of Book Three. And uh, we can maybe lead into that if you want. But he was a very knowledgeable artist, and he wanted Vincent's art. And it's recorded that he would spend hours trying to copy Vincent's art unsuccessfully. And his and his son, who also thought he was an artist, uh, wanted his art. So there's another motive because the third book, the title of the third book is "The Day Vincent Van Gogh Is Murdered." Yeah, left. tell us about that. Tell us about that. Yes, the day that Vincent van Gogh was murdered led to <clears throat> the greatest art heist ever. 26 van Gogh, like, excuse me, paintings were stolen from around where he was laid out and they were taken right after he was buried. So on the way back from burying him, the father and son had a wheelbarrow stashed at the back door of the inn 
and they took 26 paintings and his wow. uh, paraphernalia and stuff. Another another motive. Oh, an absolute motive. Yeah, and also part of the cover-up of Dr. Gachet. Yeah, because when you say cover-up, what's the best cover-up for a person that just got out of an asylum about two months ago that people thought was a little bit strained because he was very frenetic and he could paint the canvas a day and people that watched him said it was unbelievable. How can you do that if you're insane? Right, but the question they raised or used was if he really was crazy and uh, strange and he committed suicide, well, that's a great excuse and a cover-up for a murder. What's the best excuse? I killed him because she was with my daughter? <clears throat> I didn't nope. want the family. Not a good excuse. <laughs> or the guy was a little nuts and he got a gun and shot himself. That that was that was completely it. So, you <laughs> know, the, the dark and romantic legend of Vincent is that he was a tortured artist, as you as we were just discussing, who contemplated suicide. It's a great story. But you believe he was misunderstood. So who who was he? Give us a real glimpse, Irv, into who Van Gogh really was. Well, he wasn't contemplating suicide. There's a lot of letters between him and his brother where they talk about suicide and said that that's something we should never contemplate. And that more the contemporary review that we did of his suicide uh, profile by modern standards indicates he didn't have any likelihood of wanting to do to commit suicide. So that's a big negative. That's a what do they call it? It's a, a red herring. Mm -hmm. But it's a hell of a good one because it worked for a hundred and some years that Vincent committed suicide. Yeah, it sure did. All, and all focus on the murder or anything that might support the murder was shoved under the carpet. And the family didn't want to dig into it because they wanted only because it would have brought to the fore the relationship of Vincent and Marguerite. So they wanted to sweep that under the rug and keep the family story really nice and clean and modern. Victoria. Oh, you know, you're, you're not the only person who supports the narrative that Vincent was murdered. Um, and yeah. you have invited um, critics to, uh, you know, talk about and dispute your findings. How have the critics actually reacted to your work? Has anyone tried to dispute it? Not face to face. They have not come on in any way where we could actually have a discussion. What they've done is stonewall. For example, the editor of the art newspaper in London, um, when I was getting the foreword written by the, the curator of the Denver Art Museum, who had done a big Van Gogh exposition, exhibit, exhibition. Um, he said, well, Sat, I have a good friend. He loves Van Gogh. He writes about Van Gogh all the time. He would love to have one of your books. And so you should send him one. And so I sent him a book at great expense from Denver Rice expressed it, you know, FedExed it, was over a hundred bucks. Oh, the guy, my. The guy, wow. the, guy, the guy never acknowledged receipt, never reviewed the book. In other words, he does book reviews. He does all kinds of bits and pieces about Vincent. That's his thing. And he blogs about it. He never acknowledged it. So it was a total stonewall. And he's the guy who edited and wrote the 10 reasons that Vincent committed suicide. Ah which we have written about and exposed as nonsense because there's no hard evidence that anything they've written would stand up in court to confirm that Vincent committed suicide. Okay, so why is the suicide narrative still thriving? Because the art world wants it. They don't want to change whatever because that's the way there it's been. And... I'll give you a really cogent example. When the people who first wrote about Vincent being murdered, that would be uh, Stephen Napa and his 
uh, co-author White Smith. They wrote a brilliant, almost thousand-page biography of Vincent called Vincent, or no, sorry, Van Gogh, The Life. And when they wrote this book, came out in 2011, they added an appendix because the amount of research they did was monumental. I doubt seriously there will ever be another more definitive biography of Van Gogh. And as an appendix, they wrote a thing saying, well, maybe Vincent was murdered by these two kids. And it was just an appendix in the book. And it caused such an uproar in the art history community that still goes on to this day. But what's really interesting is when they sent it to some colleagues at the museum in Amsterdam, one of the curators at the museum in Amsterdam wrote back to them and said, oh, don't publish that about the murder of Van Gogh because that would be a blasphemy against Van Gogh's image, Van Gogh's whatever you want to call it, his, his remembrance, his legend. So the art history community has been against this concept from the get-go. And the fact that it got published caused a tremendous amount of back and forth in the art world history. And so Mayfa and White Smith got the world's gun shot wound expert to analyze the data. And that was um, published in the in that book, in their letters. And he was a world expert. He wrote the definitive textbook on gunshot wounds, now in its third edition. Wow. And he was one of my co-authors on um, the article forensic article because he was a forensics expert mm -hmm. on on the fact that Vincent can possibly have shot himself without a, a gunshot wound. I mean, without a... Uh, the black, yeah, without the residue. It's really, it's really almost impossible to dispute. I mean, it seems that it is gaining momentum in uh, Julian Schnabel's film in 2018, At Eternity's Gate, starring William. Yeah. That was that was a great film. So the the scene at the um, toward the end depicts Vincent being shot by a couple of young men after an altercation. So yes. it's gaining momentum, it seems. Well, I saw that movie, and I thought it was a brilliant portrayal by uh, to show that Vincent was unstable and was going to commit suicide. And I think the, my own analysis, I don't have any evidence to support this, but I thought that they thought they got to the end of the shooting of the movie and then some of this stuff came out about the two kids shooting them. And they just kind of threw it in there? They just threw it in at the end. I, I felt like that too, because I watched that movie a couple of times and the, the entire film was really based on how unstable he was. Exactly. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he gets shot by these two kids for no and reason. There's no narrative to explain it. There's no follow up. And I got the feeling that Schnabel just threw that in to be contemporaneously correct with the ongoing theory. But but it but but it was still there, so it probably did incite some type of dialogue about it, which is always good. Well, in the book, I did an amazing, re I thought, review of all the movies and documentaries about Vincent. Uh, there's a whole chapter in there where I did a um, Roger Ebert type of review of each of the movies. Oh, that's great. I'm sure our listeners would love to see that. So what what is the most in all these somewhat 30 plus years or what's the most interesting thing that you discovered about Vincent that perhaps none of us know about? Well, in the first book, I, I characterized him as having Asperger syndrome, that he really wasn't crazy, crazy. He was just a brilliant 
he was somewhat tortured because people didn't understand him. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't really relate to people. And that's fairly characteristic of Asperger. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because now Elon Musk has Asperger's and he's obviously a, a poster boy for Asperger's, but so is Vincent. Oh, and, that is interesting. And if you think about Vincent's life from that childhood on as a, as Asperger's and a, um, ASD, he, it kind of fits together a lot better. And when you think of it that way, Vincent wasn't really crazy. He was very different. He was very hard to understand, but he saw things and, and Asperger type people like Elon Musk are so creative and, and out looking on different pathways. So it kind of fits. And I thought that was I just had seen patients when I was a doctor and I knew about Asperger's. And so I thought, well, that would explain Vincent's behavior. I don't think he was really crazy. I think he was just different. And if you add in the fact that he was so afraid with his many years attacks, which he was still having, that he would forever lose his ability to paint with the Asperger's, that would make him paint more. And right. Fact, he was frantic he to paint as much as he could. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think those two things together help explain a lot. And I thought that that was a contribution to change, at least in my thinking, a lot of the ongoing old narratives that need to be relooked at and updated. It just makes so much sense. So, Irv, what questions about his death do you believe still remain unanswered, or have you unearthed everything? <laughs> well, I, I tried to. Try to go after a lot of things, like the mental illness, the suicide. You know, we we've gone over most of the things. I think the gun is a big mystery too, because without an autopsy, without a bullet, the kind of wound that there was described, this little tiny pea-sized entry wound, wound without a black. Uh, powder bullet, uh, black powder ring could just as easily have been a knife wound or an ice pick. Right. And could have been the same kind of thing. Nobody heard a gunshot. Nobody saw the, the shooting or the murder or whatever happened. And there's no crime scene. There's no There's no real evidence. It's all hearsay. So just based on what we do know, I went back and recreated and analyzed it by more modern techniques. And there, if there's no black powder ring, then he didn't shoot himself. And if he didn't shoot himself, whoever did murdered him. So that certainly changes the dynamic of Vincent's death. And it, it kind of explained why the people who stole 26 of his paintings, you know, covered up the murder. And and you detail all of that in your third book of the trilogy, uh, The Day Vincent Van Gogh Was Murdered. Well, yes, and I think there's a little bit of that in book two, because leading into that, I think we, we sort of prepared the world for book three. Excellent. And when is the pub date for that? Good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's almost 2024, so I think I can say 2024 is pretty likely. Okay. I think I'm working on it a little bit this morning. And we're Excellent. just getting reviews back now for uh, Love and Murder, which are quite good. We got a nice review from Kirkus and a couple others. Well-deserved. Uh, Well-deserved. So tell us about the Killing Vincent Project. Well, the Killing Vincent Project is what you've seen me do over 30, 40 years, sort of put it together. So we have the intellectual property of the three books, and the three books and the story is now been put into a screenplay uh, and a pilot film. And Congratulations. A Bible for an eight-episode miniseries which we're trying to uh, 
get to streaming. Wow, like, that's so exciting. Like Netflix. Wow. We have that together, and we've actually had a line runner produce a budget. So they go through and take out all the scenes from the from the pilot and figure out how many scenes we have to do, who's supposed to be in it, how much is it going to cost, and they're the ones that actually make sure the, the budget, once it's accepted, is, and they don't go over budget. And so we're at that stage in this process. And we're Bert, off- did you expect any of this when you started this, when you started thinking about Van Gogh in high school? No, no. <laughs> I, I, was one, I just wanted to be a good doctor. Well, I'm sure you were that as well, obviously. Well, I had fun with that. I did help a few patients. That was really nice. But besides the the movie, the Saturday miniseries that we're doing, we're also trying to prepare a documentary, a uh, CGI, a computer-generated uh, documentary that assists us in taking Vincent's autopsy to the nth degree, since we logistically can't get permissions to do that. And although we, we the two co-authors on the um, article, from the, on the forensics article, said they would love to do a graveside autopsy. I'm sure they, they would. Getting permission to do it and the site visit and the costs and everything. So the people on the documentary side were not real excited about trying to do that with a very limited likelihood of success. But we can read, we can do that, accomplish that with computer generated images where we go this way and find this, or we go this way and find that or whatever, and how those interrelate and how that relates to the, what we understand about the death of Vincent Van Gogh. So all that is doable. And so we have a lot of projects, and that's part of it. And then we've written all these papers. We're going to write one on the, the smoking gun, where we talked about how that gun they found could possibly have been the one they used to shoot Vincent. We've done an article on Asperger's. We've done an article on suicide protocols, um, the epilepsy, and there's a, a list of more things to come. So that's what the Killing pro, killing Vincent project is trying to do, is trying to get rid of all the untruths and try and strive to bring together the truths about Vincent's life, his loves, and his death. Well, we, we all appreciate it. Um, share with us your website so that we can find out where to purchase the books, the trilogy, and also learn about your work. There is so much to read about and to see. Well, thank you. The Killing Vincent Project website is www.killingvincent.com. And on the website, there's a lot of embedded videos. I mean, tons of stuff about the forensics. You can see all of the different data as it, and how it was collected on the forensic side. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, related to a movie, if you go the first drop down on the Killing Vincent website is the sizzle to the movie. Oh. And what we what you haven't touched on is why did Vincent why was he murdered? Well we 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 tried to touch on it, but we had so much to cover. So yeah, tell us about that. I wanted you to bring that up. Why? The big why. Well he was in love and uh, with Marguerite, who we met on the first day when he came to Lovers a week out of the asylum. And they had chemistry. The best friend noticed it. And it was well understood by the village people, but it was not promoted by the people that actually wrote Vincent's life and his brothers after his death. They, they sort of sanitized the story. But the truth of it is, Vincent, when he met Dr. Gachet and Marguerite, wanted to paint her. Vincent, as you'll remember, always was searching for models to paint. Always. That's why he painted prostitutes and 
and workers in the field. And then he painted Dr. Gachet because Dr. Gachet got very upset when Vincent painted Marguerite in the garden, a very famous painting, without his permission. So Vincent then said, oh, well, I'll paint you, which placated Dr. Gachet. And so he painted him the very famous portrait of Dr. Gachet. And then he painted another copy of it that he sent to his brother, Theo. Those are the portraits of Dr. Gachet. Very famous. So then he got permission from Dr. Gachet to paint Marguerite at the piano. But he didn't get permission to paint her at other situa situations. And as their love blossomed, uh, it became a real issue. So Vincent tried to have the image of his love with him. And he wasn't a fan of photography, but he was a hell of a good painter. So what he did from memory or sketches, he painted three portraits of a peasant girl. And that's what they were named by the art history people. These are three portraits, or these are portraits of a peasant girl. Well, in the previous years, Vincent had painted peasant girls at work, and they weren't seated and they weren't portrait-like paintings. They were people in the fields working. And so there's a whole analysis showing that what Vincent did in the past was portraits of an art of working women, and they were nothing like the portraits of the three paintings of, of the women in, uh, that were called peasant, peasant girls. So what I've done, I think, convincingly is shown that these three portraits are misnamed. They were really Marguerite Clementine Gachet, and when Dr. Gachet and his son found out they were unmasked. That the person sitting in the paintings wasn't a peasant girl. It was really Marguerite. That they went ballistic and they had a meeting that's documented by another art historian, Mark Ido Trolban, who documented that Vincent met with Dr. Gachet, Paul Jr., and Marguerite on the morning of the time, on the day he was murdered. And we have a pretty good idea where the crime scene was because Paul Jr. painted uh, a painting of this barn and fields. And he, on the back of it, he wrote the place where Van Gogh committed suicide. And this was yeah. 1904. Or 1905, and so it's kind of strange that he knew where Van Gogh committed suicide, and I sort of look at that as maybe he was trying to sanitize his remembrances because he was there, but he wanted the truth out, but he didn't want to say, hey, I shot him, and he probably was the trigger man, the son was, rather than the father. Because, sir, if you refer to it as an honor killing, it was to preserve Marguerite's honor. Exactly. Because when they, the, that morning that they came to talk to the doctor and his son, they came, Marguerite came with him to say, we want to get married. And this is what the, the best friend knew. And that didn't end well. No, it did. Well, after lunch, we're going to meet at the barn. And that's where he got shot. Hence, hence, love and murder, the last days of Vincent van Gogh. So, Irv, where can our listeners and viewers purchase uh, this book, your first one, and the coming soon, book three of the trilogy? Well, you can get it from the website, and I think that directs you back to uh, Amazon. But you can also get the, the book is a hardcover, a softcover. There's an e-book. And we are in the process now of doing an audio book. Wonderful. For so, love and murder. Killing Vincent is just um, hardcover, softcover. Irv, can you hold up the book so our viewers can see it up close and personal? 
Sure. So what, uh, lastly, Irv, what is your favorite Van Gogh work and why? Do you have one? That's a good question. It's a hard I, one. I loved his, his self-portraits. There's like 35 of them. But to me, as a doctor, I looked at the self-portraits and I thought, in order to paint a self-portrait, you have to look in the mirror and study this and think. And to me, that is a major meditative exercise. And I think that's what kept Vincent focused and kept him somewhat sane. When he painted the self-portraits, he was expressing himself, thinking about what was going on in his world, trying to make sense of it. And interestingly, when he got to Auvers and fell in love with Marguerite, there were no further self-portraits. He stopped there. He didn't paint any more self-portraits. And I think it was his most calm and comfortable time in his life. It was only seven weeks, but it was the best time. And some of his most amazing paintings were done. Fascinating. Herb, this has been so fascinating. Um, thank you so much for enlightening us. Uh, we look forward to reading book three. And um, it was wonderful. Any last words that you'd like to um, share with our readers before and our listeners and our viewers? Well, I, I think book three is going to not summarize, but rely on the other work. It's going in a whole new area because now Vincent is dead and Marguerite is alive and the 26 pieces of art live on. And so a lot of the story is what happened to the art? How did Marguerite get survive her life, did Vincent and Marguerite have a bastard son? And there's a whole bunch of things in book three that were just touching the surface of. Don't give anything away. Oh, I'm not. Okay. It, it, it will fit together, and uh, it's going to come out one way or another. And I appreciate your incisive questions and understanding. It was very, a lot of fun. Thank you. It really was. It was fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. Dr. Irv Arenberg, author of Love and Murder, The Last Days of Vincent Van Gogh. This is your hostess, Gabby Olzak of The Gab Talks. Until our next podcast, keep on reading. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby.